All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Kelly Hibbert, National President of the American Medical Student Association, and I want to welcome you all uh, to National Primary Care Week 2016. So some of you may have joined in on a few of our conversations already throughout the week, or this might be your first one. Either way, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining. Um, just to let you know, we do have a little box, maybe in the bottom right-hand corner, but in the bottom of one of the corners of your screen, there is a Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout the course um, of this presentation, go ahead and jot them down there and we'll be sure to keep track and we'll get your questions answered. Also, um, be sure to mute yourself uh, if you're just joining um, or if you've been on the line, mute yourself so we don't have any background noise. And also, I've put in the little chat box our hashtag for National Primary Care Week. So it's hashtag NPCW2016. Be sure to tweet us, um, be sure to mention us on Facebook, talk about National Primary Care Week, um, and mention all the great things that you're learning tonight from Dr. Simmons. So I want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Simmons. Just one moment here. All right, so we have with us Dr. Tyler Simmons from AACOM, or the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. And tonight he's going to be talking to us about addressing mental health in a primary care setting. So right now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Simmons and he'll take it away. Can you hear me? Now we can. There we go. There we go. Am I on now? Yep, you're good to go. Beautiful. I want to thank AMSA for inviting me to come speak about primary care and mental health. And I want to thank Kelly because Kelly, like like me, we're both NSU grad well, I'm an NSU graduate and you graduated as well. Um, and we've had a number of Nova Southeastern people involved with AMSA with Brittany Kessler who was president in 2014, 2015, and a number of AMSA presidents that I work with on a regular basis. Liz Wiley from GW, who is an AMSA president, is very involved with Maryland State Medical Society. Jay Bott, another AMSA president, is now president of FREET, the Health Resources Education Trust for the American Hospital Association, and Lena Wen, who's now the health commissioner for Baltimore City. Personally, I'm an internist. I was in practice for 16 years, um, kept practice of two to 3,000 patients that I was their primary care doc. And after that, I had my midlife crisis and went into medical education policy working for osteopathic medical schools. And a big reason for my change is I wanted to be a primary care doctor. I wanted to be involved in the care of my patients, be involved in their life. And I wanted to, to really have the, the ideal primary care practice. I did have it, but the world's changed, and I couldn't have it anymore because the place I worked split up inpatient and outpatient care. They were breaking down medical care into discrete units, which made it hard to do everything. And I wanted to be involved in trying to recreate primary care and see where it's going and try and make it as productive as possible. So we're going to talk about primary care and mental health. Both of them are concepts that are a little bit tough to get your hands around, kind of like hugging a cloud. They don't have clear patterns that you can adjust to because they go wherever the people go. And I want to try and make this as interactive as possible. So um, I am able to see the attendees. And I don't know how many of the attendees are students in medical school, pre-med students. So I was going to ask people to go into the chat box. And if you're a medical student or a physician, type in one. And if you're a pre-med student, type in two. So let me see if you guys can do that and see who's here. So we've got both medical students and pre-medical students here. More medical students than pre-meds, but pretty close. So feel free to interrupt me with questions, issues as we're going along. Um, just a disclaimer, 
this lecture is given by me personally. The views are my own, not my employer. And I have no co financial conflicts of interest. I don't own stock in any companies. Um, and there are no financial interests that would um, interfere. What I want to talk about is both primary care and mental health. I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy of primary care and the mission, vision, and core drivers we have. I want to look at the people we're taking care of and what their expectations are and where they're coming from, and then figure out where mental health is fitting in our healthcare system at this point. So primary care is both a relationship and a structure. It's interacting with patients, developing an, a relationship, a trust over time. And it's a structure so that people know where they go for what, where they can go to get care, where they can go to get questions answered, and where they can get information that they want. But primary care today is not like primary care 20 years ago. And it's true for medicine. It's true for our whole society. Technology and information has changed the way we do everything. Everything we do today can be done differently. And we're exploring different ways of doing it and watching where it's taking our system. But our system is very different. And the only time not to expect change in today's society is if you're dealing with a vending machine. Otherwise, change will be a constant. We're seeing managed care creep into the medical system. Managed care is the application of standard business practices to healthcare. It's turning what we do in medicine into products and selling those products and putting our products in front of patients and telling them why it benefits them. It's also getting feedback and trying to prioritize those things that we feel would be most beneficial to, to provide to our patients. Another thing we're seeing is when I call people patients, I'm often corrected now in that they're not patients, they're people. And people don't want to be looked at as someone to be taken care of just when they're sick. And on the other side, they want to get to their optimal level of health. They want to figure out what they can do to live to 120. They want to figure out what they can do to run faster, jump higher, sleep less, drink more, eat better. Um, and these are things that currently they're not sure where to go. And the doctor is the first place they are going because in primary care, we're the ones who are helping them figure out the structure of thought, the structure of seeking out care. And the other thing that's happening with primary care is people are realizing that it has value, not only in the care we provide, but in the care we guide. A recent study showed that 50% of all healthcare dollars that are spent originate with the primary care provider. So even though we might only be eight or 9% of healthcare itself, um, in what physicians are paid, we are directing what tests are done, what specialists are seen, and how the system is, is going to work. So that's a power that goes beyond our office. So patients don't want to be called people, but they do want us to help them make their lives easier and more comfortable. They want to know what we know. And they want to know something beyond what they can get from a Google search. So they're going to make their own decisions. And they're going to take what we tell them and compare it to what they've been able to find in their own research. Their own research may be two to five minutes of searching. But it still carries a lot of weight because they discovered it themselves. And one of the things you discover quickly in primary care is the right answer isn't always the right answer for the patient in front of you. I take care of a lot of athletes, and I can tell you, if someone's been preparing for, an, for a marathon for three or four months, and they've gone through their long runs, and they've adjusted their diet, and they're ready to run, a sprained ankle is not going to stop them. You may tell them that they've got a sprained ankle, they need rest, ice, compression, and elevation, they need two weeks off, they need gentle range of motion, they need stretching, they need compression, they need, it doesn't matter. They're going to do what they want to do. How does that interact with mental health? Well, we often look at mental health differently than our patients. Mental health is still lagging behind physical health and where patients see it fits in the healthcare system. So if you tell somebody, 
sleeping 12 hours a day is not normal, and we need to look at why. It may be thyroid, it may be anemia, it may be a metabolic abnormality, but it may be anxiety, depression, or another psychological issue that we can address and help. But if the person is able to continue to function, they may not see that. So in primary care, we start by diagnosing a person. And one of the big things in primary care is differential diagnosis. Differential diagnosis is when you get paid to look at the worst possible cause. Make sure you don't miss the bad stuff. Somebody can come to you saying, I just moved from one apartment to another, lift, lifted my couches, lifted my beds, and I've got back pain. Yeah, they probably have back pain. And over 90% of the time, that's gonna be the cause. And some people might jump to treating that. Some fields of healthcare will treat the most probable cause. But in medicine, as physicians, we still have to think broader and make sure that there's no cancer, infection, or trauma. It could be as simple as looking at the temperature, looking at the vital signs, asking about weight loss, asking about mechanism of injury, and looking at the motion the person has and making sure that you can still get neutral motion, side bending right, rotating left, make sure that you still have a potential for motion before you say, yeah, it's probably the move. Because four or five times out of 100, you still may catch something more serious. Um, in mental health, we have to deal with wellness um, as well as the mental health aspects of severe illness or intractable illness or even side effects of care that people are getting. So these are things that are going to have an effect. And these are things that we in primary care are going to see it before the patient. We're going to know what it can do because a lot of what our experience gives us and a lot of the reason why residencies take three years is you have to learn the natural history of an illness. You have to see where it's coming from and where it's going to. And I'm just looking at who's joined us. Thank you, welcome. And this is moving on its own. So I will move backwards. There we go. So again, thinking like a physician, you're gonna start with a diagnosis, but mental health that starts with a diagnosis quickly moves into therapy and treatment. And if we make the diagnosis in primary care, we can treat them initially. But if things are difficult or things can be handled more efficiently, a lot of times the talk therapy is separated out to somebody who is trained differently. The support for mental illness may still happen in our offices, but a social worker or a psychologist or a therapist may get involved as well. Medication management, while we start medication management, and most of the time primary care will handle it for anxiety and for depression, in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, it's often handled by a psychiatrist who does just the medication management. So mental health is also being broken down into its parts, and while we do get the ability to manage them, to see these people when they're going through their crisis and to help. We are gonna develop more of a team approach. We are gonna take care of the patient, support the patient, but also work with other professionals who are doing, this, doing one part of the care repeatedly. And I just wanted to share, since we do have a lot of medical students. I want to show you what the students of the Council of Osteopathic Student Government Presidents were saying about mental health and where they're coming from. So let me go to um, Kelly. Can you um, play the video? And I don't hear any sound. So 
So I wanted to share this with you so you can look at it later when you do have sound yourself. Because it's a pretty good video. And one of the things that Malik asked me to talk about was medical students and mental illness. Because Tate Shanfeld from the Mayo Clinic did a survey of three medical schools um, and looked at do we take healthy people and make them sick or do we take sick people and make them um, and, and leave them sick throughout medical school? What he found is that medical students come in strong and then there are pain points that really hurt them. First test is a big pain point. End of first year is a pain point. Um, third year, and the start of third year is when people feel least supported and have the most anxiety. We know that 40 to 50 percent of medical students will have anxiety severe enough to interfere with daily function. We know that a third of medical students, about 30 percent, will have symptoms consistent with depression, where if they showed up to a physician's office, we would treat them. But we take students who are healthier, who are stronger, who are more resilient. But then fourth year, life gets easy. And then when they start internship, life gets even harder again. We know that about 400 physicians a year commit suicide. We know there are hundreds of students out there who are considering hurting themselves, who have a plan, and who feel that they'll probably act on it in the next 30 days. And that's because they're living through things they haven't lived through before. That's because they're human and they're experiencing human emotions and they're dealing with it like any person would deal with it. And then it gets taken to the extreme and they don't ask for help. It becomes important that we know the signs of anxiety, we know that the signs of depression, we know the signs of suicidality, and we know how to get people help. That's something that as medical students we have to deal with because while life isn't an illness, it has illness as part of it. And while stress is an activator and gets you moving and gets you out of bed in the morning, it's also a limiter and stops you from sleeping at night and makes your eating patterns much different than is healthy. And it often takes an external evaluation to see what's going on. And that's why mental health is so important. Because, again, we're moving into an era where people want to optimize health. We know that over 50%, close to 60% of students in medical school are taking medication for enhanced functioning. I'm not talking about caffeine, even though caffeine is a drug that does matter and it does make a difference. Um, the guarana drinks, the taurine drinks are also drugs that matter. But close to 60% of medical students will be taking something for anxiety, something for depression, something for ADHD something to enhance their life. Because you're leaders. You know that this is possible. You know that the information we have, what we learn in physiology and pathophysiology can be used to enhance life as well as just diagnose illness. We can hurt ourselves with that knowledge. And we are hurting ourselves with that knowledge. Medical school sleeping sickness, where you figure out where you can go with three and a half hours of sleep and still function the next day, sure you can but your mood is going to be affected. Your relationships will be affected. Your ability to tolerate stress, your ability to tolerate changes becomes different and it will affect your relationships. So understanding that stress is, stress is both an activator and an enhancement and helpful, but also a limiter on functioning is important. So where we're going with healthcare is that mental health has to be more than mental illness. And you know that your emotional well-being matters. It affects your relationships. It affects your ability to do well on tests. And we also know that personality is part of mental health and part of well-being. I know that we attract a lot of students who are good questioners, who are good at seeing the problems in the structure of society and the structure of functioning. 
that can also be oppositional defiant disorder. If you never accept the status quo, if you never accept the structure as acceptable, it's going to cause trouble with relationships. It might get you through medical school. It might show where your thinking is strong and where your assessment values are strong. And it may get you to succeed both in medical school, residency, and business. But it's not going to have you succeed with relationships and in society as a whole. You're going to have trouble finding your heart. So when we talk about mental health, the development and maintenance of mental health is key. And that has to include more than just mental illness. So self-acceptance is one that our students have trouble with. They can always do better. And they tend to see themselves as their accomplishments. They tend to see themselves as their scores on their tests. They also tend to be very autonomous, both in thought and action. Medical students like being left alone. That's why we'll probably have three times as many people watching a video as attending class. They want to do it on their own time, on their own speed, and that's doable. Um, but when you don't have appointments for lectures, you also don't have appointments for friends. You also don't have dates like other people have dates because it gets fit in with your other parts of life. And your partner is going to have to learn to adapt. And they do adapt, but that's not always healthy. At times, you do need to prioritize appointments and other time schedules as well. Because what that does is it stagnates your mental growth. It stagnates your personality growth. Because personality has to be developed individually first. It doesn't have to be. But ideally, it's developed personally first and then shared with others. And life is lived with people. But if you're compartmentalizing how and where you interact with people, it changes the interactions. So mental health development for medical students is different than it is for others. Part of why we have to look at this is that health is different than health care. People want health more than they want health care. They don't want to be thought of as a patient who's sick. They want to look at us as coaches who are making life better. And the health care system, since 19, the 1980s, when standard business practices were brought into practice, has become a business. We've seen consolidation of systems. We've seen hospitals join together. We've seen hospitals spread out and establish care centers outside of where the main hospital is. We've seen care shunted from one provider to another. Ten years ago, 15% of Americans went for chiropractic care for their musculoskeletal health. Now it's under 5% because they're not part of the system. They're external. And it has to be patient-driven and patient-initiated. The rest of healthcare tends to be driven by primary care. So when primary care is leading what's going on, we're going to look at people differently. We know what's optimal. We know what we can do. The other thing that's happening in the healthcare system is I feel it's going a little bit further than we know about in science because business is now shunting care to people who are not licensed. What is a healthcare assistant? Well, when hospitals send people out to the home after a surgery or after cellulitis or after um, any kind of wound care to, to check on it, that healthcare assistant may not have any training. They may be just be looking for problems to see when to bring them back into the system. They may be given four hours of orientation or, or eight hours, but we've moved past licensure. So our system is where has gotten to the point where professionals are not in charge of everything. And when we talk about a professional, it's anybody who's licensed, anybody who has something to lose for the care they give. And the data drives the practice of medicine where Licensed professionals are more expensive than unlicensed professionals. And if business can hire people who are not licensed to get certain things done and there's no oversight and no structure, they will do it. And that's what we're seeing happen. 
So primary care physicians are, or primary care, people who provide primary care, are the point of first contact. They're where, peop where people think they need to start to get into the system. There are some things that are pseudo-primary care, commercial care. If you go to the Target or Walgreens or a Minute Clinic or one of those um, healthcare systems that will treat the 10 most common or most profitable conditions, is that primary care? People want to weigh in? You can comment and let me know what you think. Because we don't know. People are going there first because it's convenient. And it does look like primary care. Um, but is it? If you're limiting what you do and you're limiting your interaction, they can't refer you because they don't have the networks, they don't have the connections to do it. So I would say it isn't, but let me see if anybody is chatting. Nope. Nobody wants to weigh in on whether a continuous care clinic, um, could it be that there are too few PCPs? Right now, there are about 700,000 physicians in practice. Um, we do know that 2014 was the first year there were more PAs and NPs graduating from healthcare institutions in the U.S. than there were DOs and MDs. So we do know that the culture is shifting because the population is shifting. Um, someone is saying that they don't think it is, agreeing with me that it's not quite primary care, but it's an aspect of primary care. So we have physicians to fill the system, but you can do it cheaper. And you can train a PA in two years, and PAs and NPs, both of which take two years, don't have GMA. They don't have graduate medical education. And that's why we've been calling them mid-levels, because they do the primary training, the undergraduate training, but they don't do the graduate training. Um, we say graduate training has to be a minimum of three years because the natural history of an illness often takes three years to come out, particularly in mental health. Mental health, it can take three months to two years for a disease to come out. So if you're not watching, if you're not part of the system, it may not occur quickly and you may not get to see it. And that's part of the reason why graduate medical education lasts three years. So you're in one place and you can follow the natural history of an illness. And that's why residencies have a requirement for a continuity clinic or continuity care so that the conditions can be put into the context of a patient's life. Another comment was, uh, they're the first point of contact, yes, but the primary care providers concern with the medical history and day-to-day -day life, not the same for a place like a minute clinic. Very true. Um, but they will argue that while we have electronic medical records and we have data systems, our systems are closed to within a system and siloed because if you leave the state or go to a different system, it's not linked as well. That's a major concern we have and needs to happen so that primary care can happen much more effect effectively. But in my definition, which is still being debated, I see primary care as a place for the undifferentiated patient to come in and get direction and get training. I, I'm sorry, and get care. Because if you can't get that kind of assistance, you might be starting off in the wrong place. And if you go to a place that's prioritizing the most common conditions or the most the ones that are most profitable, that's a different way of doing care. So um, that is a debate we're going to see a lot more in the future. And I can tell you that we've seen a lot of changes because this debate is taking place. Target started clinics a number of years ago, but when they realized, well, when there were complaints that their clinics didn't have sinks and they couldn't wash their hands, uh, the providers couldn't wash their hands. They couldn't touch their patients. It became a different level of care. We do know that CVS was attacked because you're telling people they shouldn't smoke, they shouldn't drink, they should do healthy behaviors in a place that was selling cigarettes and alcohol. And they made the brave decision to say, you're right. 
you can't be in a business that destroys health and helps health. And they went with the health industry, and they got rid of selling cigarettes. And in the future, they are talking about getting rid of alcohol from all their stores as well. So uh, they become a health industry, and not an industry that talks about free choice and here's the cigarettes and here's our advice not to buy them. Because there's a hypocrisy there that makes it difficult for the patient to take your advice when you have both of them occurring at the same place. So the definition of primary care is changing. Um, and where, health, where mental health fits is changing as well. The historic model is, and this is osteopathic in nature, a person is a combination of mind, body, and spirit. Wellness is a matter of balance between all three. But that model is changing as well because people are saying, I don't want to be put into that, those simple paradigms. I think a little bit more complex and mind, body, and spirit might be good, but where does emotion fit in that? And how about the physical environment? And mind, body, and spirit in prison is different than mind, body, and spirit in school, which is different than somebody who's on vacation. What's the culture? So our zeitgeist, our, zeitgeist, our way of being right now is changing. And how we're looking at things is quite different than it was before. So it's gotten more complex. We can handle much more information. And we're looking at doing things differently. Another thing that we're seeing is people are coming to us for things that we never treated before. I've had many patients come to me and say, how do I deal with failure? What do I do to get out of this funk? Well, funk isn't a diagnosis I had made or was taught in medical school, but it's a real condition. Rejection is something that people deal with all the time and is part of your mental health. Medical school students know about loneliness, and the time they spend stu studying. But how do you counsel somebody who fails out of medical school? How do you deal with the limitations you have of failing boards, failing the COMLEX, or failing USMLE? Those are things that are real medical issues that we have yet to put a name to, but we are working on it because people are demanding it. So even mind, body, spirit is not broad enough, and putting it into context does matter. Another thing we're seeing introduced is spirituality. And where does spirituality fit in medicine? There are a number of new medical schools starting at religious institutions that are saying they want to fit spirituality in and spirituality matters. We know that students who have spirituality are less likely to think about suicide, that it is a protective matter in mental health. Um, it doesn't change their depression, but it does change anxiety levels. So spirituality, um, which can be broken out into beliefs and ritual, differs. Medical students tend to react against the ritual of religion where the same thing is done over and over. They tend to react less to the understanding of a spiritual life, a spiritual being, um, and finding out where that fits in healthcare is something that we have to address. We won't be doing videos right now, but I strongly feel that a healthy spirit is as important as a healthy spleen. And knowing what your spirit is like is going to be critical in order to stay healthy and address it yourself. The other place we see mental health is in behaviorally related issues. How do we deal with smoking and mental health? Patients have been telling us for years they smoke because it makes them feel better. And we tell them, yeah, it doesn't make you feel better because you're going to die sooner. It's going to cut years off your life. Well, they feel better when they smoke. It's a way of dealing with stress. It's a way of dealing with life. It's a way of getting a break when they're working. And that may be a mental health issue that destroys their physical health. So these are issues that we have to start addressing that we haven't addressed before. We know alcohol is a depressant. We know it's a drug, but it's more common than ever. Marijuana is an interesting issue, particularly for medical students, because it's legal in many states now. How do you deal with a legal drug that affects your ability to think 
that students are using, but hospitals are saying, we don't want you to use it. They're interesting issues and they're behavioral health issues because people are using marijuana for a reason. We do know that there are side effects, that if you don't recover fully between uses, that it could be dangerous. And how do we deal with obesity? People who use food as a protection, people who stuff themselves to go to sleep, who raid the refrigerator when they're awake at night. Um, just going to 3,500 calories equals a pound is not gonna answer the question of when someone eats and what they eat. Those are issues we have to deal with. The big issue that's being addressed right now, though, is really non-adherence to medication schedules. We're acting like managers in medicine and saying, if we know the blood pressure medicine will increase your life by five years, you have to take it. And we're gonna look at ways to manage you to make sure you're taking it, whether it's pill counters, whether it's reminders, whether it's electronic monitoring that we have on our phones. That's a behavioral health issue that's getting a lot more attention than the other problems and we'll get more common as our data management moves on. Other mental health issues are chronic illnesses. And this ties back to the spirituality and it ties back to decision-making in health. Um, how do you deal with someone who has a chronic illness and is gonna die? And they're gonna die in three months, six months, a year, and they wanna control their pain. How do you deal with someone who's gonna have at least 20 hospitalizations this year because of a chronic condition? It will affect their mental health. And to tell them they shouldn't be depressed is ignoring their reality. So in taking the emic approach and understanding where the patient is coming from and how they're feeling is critical. And addressing the mental health issues at the same time as you're addressing the medical issues becomes important. This happens with diabetes, which is a life-ordering event, and may lead people to say it's life-ending, that they wish it were life-ending. That might be taking it to the extreme, and we have to look and see where it comes from and what we can do to help orient them and understand where their mental health can help enhance their physical health and what we have to do to address their mental health as well. One thing that I find interesting and exciting is the somatic syndromes. These are diseases we don't understand well. When I went to medical school, we said that people who had migraines had a weakness and there was something wrong with them mentally. Now that we have drugs that treat it, we've stopped saying that. But we still don't have a good feeling about taking care of people we can't treat well. The fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, interstitial cystitis, irritable bowel syndrome, all these symptoms that we know have to do with locus of control, have to do with sleep, have to do with anxiety, have to do with the body's ability to heal itself after an insult, are issues that we haven't dealt well with in medicine. When someone comes to you and says they're tired, but they've got a normal TSH, a normal CBC, a normal H&H, &H, where do we send them then? And how do we broach the issue of how are you dealing with stress? How are you dealing with relationships? What is your social support? What is your individual support? And what do you do for yourself? Do you have the 20% of your schedule needed for, that makes you happy to achieve mental health and mental parity? So a lot of our data from work shows that if 20% of your work day or your work week isn't rewarding, isn't comfortable, you won't enjoy work. You can't go full weeks without being happy. So if you're on a rotation you don't like, you're gonna be unhappy. You may start to get depressed. And fortunately, if it's only a month, you'll be un unhappy, but hopefully it won't take you too deep. But look for that 20%, look, what you're, look for what is within what you're doing that makes you happy that gets you excited, that you want to share with others and you want to talk to others about. These symptoms, insomnia, abdominal pain, numbness, um, pain on my fingers, I can't put gloves on, I can't wear socks, I hate the way my clothes feel, I feel tenderness and tightness around my belly. These are all signs that you may be experiencing somatic syndromes. 
and you may have trouble dealing with locus of control when they're lost to you. And these are mental health issues that are coming out that we have to deal with. On the other end, we talked about, um, appreciate the help. We talked about the chronic illnesses that affect mental health, the CHF diabetes. There are also the diseases that bring on mental health issues because you have to take care of them. And it removes you from free functioning because it's ordered functioning. So diabetes is a life-ordering event. We have to eat smaller meals more frequently. You can't have the large meal because your sugars will go too high, cause you to lose equilibrium, have to pee more. Obesity is also a condition that changes your body functioning. It changes your sleep. It changes your eat. It changes your ability to enjoy food. It changes your ability to move in neutral manner. It changes your ability to affect normal posture. And when that happens, you're going to have behavioral components as well. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide, which is anticipatory guidance. Um, what is anticipatory guidance and anticipatory mental health? As medical students, as pre-meds, personal development often gets delayed. We tend to be really good at delaying gratification. We tend to be really good at rationalization and using information to explain why we do what we do and how it affects health. Our social development is often delayed, and often it is deferred through medical school and then goes to rapid advancement in internship and residency when you need the social support and the support of others. Emotional development also occurs quickly and slowly depending on where you are and what time you allow yourself to develop emotionally. So these are some of the mental health issues that we have to um, worry about in medical students and figure out where we go. So the bottom line in mental health and primary care is we have to learn and teach our patients where it fits. Our patients are not going to be receptive, but they want to be healthier. So we have to show them and teach them how it's going to happen. A lesson for both our patients and others is life is lived with others. Experiences help us grow. And we have to develop a structure for mental health to occur, for mental health to advance. And primary care is an ideal place to bring mental health into the equation and to help it develop. One of the things that I like to counsel medical students on is to look at your career in three stages. Look at your first seven to 10 years after residency where you want to show off. When you finish residency, you're super trained, you can do anything and you want to do it. And you tend to do it, but you tend to do it at the expense of relationships and your own life. We put in more hours than most other people in, the, in this world. And it does show both in our enjoyment of our career, but also in our delay in mental health development. So bring these issues with you to the table when you're taking care of patients, but look at where the world is going. There's a lot of value and a lot of a lot of things that data brought to the front that we hadn't seen before. So as medical students, I know you're interested in primary care and where you're going for yourself and others, but most of you who signed up want to figure out how you can take care of others. And we want you to take care of yourself because we know that mental health for primary care providers is critical. We know that the burnout in physicians in primary care is high, embarrassingly high. And unless we pay attention to ourselves, we can't take care of our patients as well as we would like. So let's see if we've got the video fixed. Can you see if we can play this video? Kelly? This is a super video, and if we can't play it now, I, I do hope that we get to play it later and you can watch it because these are all medical students. 
This is the COSGP Mental Health Awareness Task Force. And they've come up with a plan to survey medical students first, and then to survey the medical schools and see what services are provided. And then after that, they're going to highlight the best practices, which is about where we are now. And I can tell you that one of the best practices that we've seen come out of this is there are a number of medical schools that say mental health should not be something you seek. It, um, it should be something that is a negative checkoff. Everybody in medical school should be assumed to need care. And everybody should be given an appointment with somebody for help. And then if they choose not to continue, that's fine. Um, I do have a note that the video is working. Can you play the video? Okay, um, I hear the video has ended, thank you. Um, I wanted to end on that and just say that you can't be too healthy. It is worth working for. And as medical students and pre-meds, I would focus on your own mental health. Pay attention to yourself. You could be a good model for your patients. Um, and in the future, mental health is changing rapidly. We are looking at doing it differently. And we are looking at expanding what we're considering mental health. So I hope you found this useful, and I'm happy to take questions. So there's one question. Do you know of any resources or have recommendations for students to maintain their own mental health? So medical schools are required to have mental health services both at the medical school and when you're on rotations. That's a big issue in what mental health services they have because for many schools it's access to counseling. Um, we are trying to expand that definition, but I would start with your medical school and these Schools also have the requirement that it be confidential and be separate from your medical school records so that it doesn't interfere. Um, one of the issues we're addressing in the practice world is if you do seek mental health, mental health help, does it, is it discoverable? Because in a number of states they ask on your licensing questionnaire whether or not you are getting help for mental health issues. And we are separating that out so that it is not part of licensure and that mental health services accessed um, voluntarily will be separate from those that are accessed in a mandatory fashion.
And again, when we're talking about expanding healthcare, mental health may be obtained from a professional, but you can also find friends and other ways to maintain your mental health and other ways to re get a reflection on where you are and what you need. So I think all of those are very important. If there are no other questions, I want to thank you for inviting me and having me involved with the Primary Care Week, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simmet. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I'm sure everyone else also feels the same like I do. I've been tweeting out some of your words of wisdom the entire time, and uh, I hope you all either rewatch this talk or um, also share it with your um, with your peers as well. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Summit, for joining us tonight. And I want to remind everybody to please join us uh, again tomorrow for the conclusion of National Primary Care Week. Just because tomorrow night's the conclusion of National Primary Care Week does not mean that it's the end of um, supporting and promoting primary care. We are all a part of this FM revolution, as the American Academy of Family Physicians talks about. So please join us again. We're looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Thank you.